Constitutional, Plain and Simple, Homeland Security. Part 1. A well-regulated militia, being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. U.S. Constitution, Second Amendment. In the 1770s, the British Empire had the greatest military ever known on the face of this earth, having dominated for centuries. During the North American Revolutionary War against them, these vaunted armies, navies, spies, and commanders were beaten by a mere 3% of the colonists, primarily militia members with excellent Native American support and French assistance. Following the colonial victory, U.S. founders were faced with a critical choice concerning how to defend and preserve their new nation. On one hand, they now had the opportunity to establish a centralized standing army as most of the world had, and the argument was made by some from the beginning to do so. On the other, it had just been historically proven yet again that defensive local militia can succeed where aggressive centralized standing armies cannot. So the benefits of allowing the defensive militia to continue accomplishing national security were clearly known and promoted by the founders, rather than centralized standing armies that are inferior and demonstrably dangerous to worldwide peace and prosperity. Still, many continue holding the belief that militia as military organizations are inferior to centralized standing armies, and that only the latter can handle modern dangers. However, the opposite is actually true. Explosive, chemical, and biological terrorism slash warfare existed at the time of the militia's official adoption by U.S. government, yet the founders still chose defensive militia over aggressive standing armies, especially when it comes to the duty of responding to government corruption which centralized standing armies are more prone to contribute to than defend against, unlike local militia composed of local people whose chain of command begins with local authority. Even in modern times, we can see the superiority of smaller, often more primitive decentralized forces against vast centralized militaries who are considered to be the greatest martial forces on earth. Consider the Soviet losses to comparatively feeble and primitive Middle Eastern militia, or the defeat of centralized U.S. forces in Vietnam, who were then baited to repeat the Soviet mistake in the Middle East, causing the U.S. to continue suffering attrition and blowback from the fundamental treason against the Constitution that centralized standing armies and aggressive warfare are. Consider why nations like Israel and Switzerland continue to utilize militia rather than extensive standing armies, and why the militia is even immortalized in supreme U.S. law as the only military entity authorized to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. Why Congress is constitutionally bound to appropriate resources for the militia of the several states and ensure they are ready and able to be called forth into service. This is an obligation Congress has long failed, corrupt politicians having supplanted the U.S. militia with centralized military forces now exclusively under federal control, rather than the military chain of command being buffered between the states, their localities, and the federal government as intended. What's the difference between the Army, Reserve, National Guard, FEMA, DHS, TSA, etc., and the militia of the several states? And why is it such a big deal that the militia was and still is supplanted by them? 1. Chain of Command The militia is meant to have an external chain of command that goes from county sheriff to state governor to commander-in-chief, the president, to Congress to we the people. This chain is rooted at the most local levels possible upward and is more likely to successfully nullify attempted unlawful or unjust actions, and is not exclusively under federal control, so not subject to the dangers of centralized corruption as is currently the case with most modern armed forces. 2. Locality 
In terms of national security, local people know their territory best, how to defend it, and have the most motivation for doing so successfully, more so than centralized forces who are continually deployed as pawns to foreign places to serve those with harmful political and economic agendas rather than truly defending their homeland, the constitution, freedom, or any other military recruitment pickup line. 3. Upkeep Not only are well-regulated militia militarily superior to centralized standing armies, they are also economically superior. It costs much less to achieve and maintain national security through a well-regulated defensive militia than through aggressive and ever-expanding federal forces that are wasted in ways such as the endless and deceitful global war on terror costing less even if militia members were to be paid more than current federal forces. A defensive militia based at home can significantly stimulate industry, agriculture, and many other aspects of local and national economy. Unfortunately, U.S. economy is now in dire straits due to the people's ongoing failure to heed the warnings of founders such as Thomas Jefferson about how dangerous both standing armies and central banking are to freedom, liberty, and justice. Consequently, we now live under the economic slavery and conspiratorial tyranny of every force we were warned against, and we do so without our only truly effective and authorized last resort against these threats to the people of the U.S., the militia of the several states. In 1786, the U.S. was already dealing with a sinister collusion between corrupt politicians and corrupt bankers, which allowed those in debt to be imprisoned and otherwise cruelly persecuted. The crushing economic and legal environment of government and financial corruption was enabled by the unworkable form of government first authorized by the Articles of Confederation. That same year, several veterans who had fought in the North American Revolutionary War against England began a rebellion because domestic enemies threatened the freedom, liberty, and justice of all. Daniel Shays and his followers were brave yet misguided souls without which we may still be laboring under a system where bankers can imprison people for debt and subject them to the horrors of incarcerated abuse. They intended to capture the Springfield Armory and use the supplies to overthrow the corrupt government and intended to live thereafter without any government in anarchy. Shays' rebellion was quelled by the well-regulated militia, which allowed the founders to respond to the concerns of the brave yet misguided rebels by replacing the failed Articles of Confederation with the U.S. Constitution and its Bill of Rights again choosing the well-regulated militia to accomplish national security when they could have instead created centralized standing armies such as are still ignorantly and pridefully maintained. Rather than allowing the U.S. to dissolve into anarchy which would have left the people subject to other nations, especially the recently repelled British Empire. These are Congress's ongoing constitutional obligations long betrayed and continually neglected concerning the militia of the several states. 1. To provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia, and for governing such part of them as may be employed in the service of the United States, reserving to the states respectively the appointment of the officers and the authority of training the militia according to the discipline prescribed by Congress. Two to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. U.S. Constitution, Article 1, Section 8 Consequences of failing to truly live the Constitution and its Second Amendment through the militia of the several states? Twice, the United States was born and preserved primarily thanks to its well-regulated militia and it will soon die with terrible and widespread destruction if true homeland security through the militia of the several states, as prescribed by supreme U.S. law, the Constitution, is not immediately restored 
and the ever-expanding unconstitutional Nazi-slash-Soviet-type police state, which promises security, yet is eternally incapable of delivering, and has treacherously supplanted it, is done away with and never allowed to return. In the next part, we'll examine the many attractive benefits of truly restoring the militia of the several states, and the questions of voluntary service, compensation, personal, local, national, and international impacts, and what life will be like when the people truly live according to our own constitution again, and stop being pseudo-patriotic hypocrites at the cost of self-destruction.